Hello and welcome everyone to Next on Nautilus, one of three live event series taking place during the 2020 season where you can learn more about each expedition as we move through the next few months. My name is Madison Dapsovich and I am a member of the Corps of Exploration. A reminder that you can tune into the expedition at any time at nautiluslive.org. We've been diving for the last several weeks and we are so excited to be gearing up for our next dive. Um, we're super glad to have all of you joining via Facebook and YouTube. Throughout this event, you'll be able to ask questions of our explorers by adding comments and questions through the platform that you're watching from. But to start it off, we'd love to know where you're joining us from. So please take a minute and share with us where in the world you are. Drop it in the comments. As I said, we're gearing up for almost two weeks of exploration in two submarine canyons off the coast of Washington State, one of which has never been dove in before. This is where we'll be exploring methane seeps, microbes, and believe it or not, potential medicinal discoveries awaiting our scientists in the deep sea. It's going to be a fascinating cruise. And like many of you watching from home, the Nautilus Live team is also adapting to life during COVID, which means we'll be introducing you to several special guests today from our crew while streaming from our own homes all over the country. Here with us to talk more about our upcoming crews are Dr. Andrew Thurber, Susie Cummings, Leela Arder Bellucci, and Dr. Carrie McPhail. Thank you all for joining us from wherever you are. Um, Andrew, let's start with you. Tell us a little bit about your role on the ship and, and what you're most excited for this season. So I'm one of the, um, the lead scientists of this expedition. And what we're really excited about doing is going and discovering and exploring the different methane seeps that occur off the coast of the Pacific Northwest. This is an area where we've discovered many new locations that we haven't actually seen, so we don't know how variable, and really the biodiversity of this region is not fully comprehended or understood, which means we're gonna see a lot of new stuff and things that no human has ever seen before. So I'm really looking forward to that. Absolutely, and, and who are, who's joining us with you now here? <laughs> well, I'll let them introduce themselves. Um, Hi guys, I'm Leela Bellucci, Leela Arda Bellucci. Thank you for introducing me, Madison. Um, I'm a graduate student in Dr. Thurber's lab, a first year graduate student, um, and I've also been out on Nautilus in the past, so I'm really looking forward to rejoining the Corps of Exploration and seeing what we find. Ah, Susie, y'all have to. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm, I'm Susie Cummings. I'm also a graduate student in Dr. Thurber's lab. And um, I have never actually been on the Nautilus or a research cruise before for that matter. So I'm really excited to be able to uh, get out there and start doing science there. Um, in particular, I'm really interested in the microbes and the microbial life that lives in deep sea. Absolutely, it's a fascinating topic and I'm so excited to explore it more, um, especially with everybody viewing and joining from around the world. We also have with us Dr. Carrie McPhail, um, who will be on the cruise with you. Carrie, tell us a little bit about your role and, and sort of what you're looking for with this expedition. Hi, Madison, thanks. Well, you know, I am um, a professor of natural products chemistry at Oregon State University. And so just as Andrew Thurber mentioned biodiversity, I'm interested in the chemical diversity of these methane seeps. As he said, no humans ever been. And, you know, I'm based on shore, but I'm so excited to be able to participate in the Nautilus dives alongside Andrew, Susie and Leela um, on, who are on the ship. So ultimately we hope to look at these same samples that that they get and kind of match the chemistry with the biological diversity that they see. Right, and just like many viewers join us on nautiluslive.org from around the world, we also have scientists ashore who pop in and offer their expertise. So thank you, Carrie, for being one of those scientists. And I'm so excited to see what you contribute to this expedition. Speaking of gearing up for this expedition and getting ready for it, it's a little bit different in 2020, just like I mentioned, everyone at home is, is probably feeling this new sort of normal that we've been adapting to. What's it been like to prepare for a cruise um, this year? And, and maybe how is that different than in years past? Andrew, I'll, I'll turn it over to you first. Great, great. Uh, clearly this is a different year and you know, going into the field, one of the paramount things you always have to think about is the safety of yourself and others. And COVID is seriously a concern that we all are taking um, in a variety of different ways to make sure that neither we nor anybody on the ship gets sick. So we've actually been in quarantine for two weeks. Uh, we've been tested for COVID. That's why we can be in the same place. I actually hadn't seen Susie or Leela's face the entire summer because they were be <laughs> behind masks, but that's how we can talk 
talk to you today. Uh, part of that has also been dealing with other things. Uh, there's a, we've been testing equipment on the rental house that we're in to make sure it's ready for the sea. This is not normally how one tests a new deep sea camera system before it's deployed for the first time. But uh, we've essentially been taking on each challenge presented by the, by the strange year to make sure that we can not only be prepared for the cruise, but be prepared in a way that's safe for ourselves and the, the crew of the ship as well. Absolutely. And Carrie, you've kind of been on the road lately, haven't you? Yes, I did. I guess for me, um, I've been isolating, uh, but also in, in an RV for a little bit because of um, the fires in Oregon. So that was just a really unexpected thing. And, you know, um, I hope that people are as safe as possible if they have that experience. But um, certainly, you know, we're working from home and and otherwise isolating just to make sure that um, we can be as safe as possible. And and I think it's just amazing what we can do from home and, and how science can continue even in this situation. Right, I'm so glad that you all are safe and healthy and that we're able to continue this expedition while adapting and evolving to new circumstances. And I am personally a total geek for methane seeps. I'm so excited to be diving in them. Um, for those of you who have been watching Nautilus, methane seeps form unique habitats that are driven by all sorts of complex systems and they're just fascinating to watch and it's very exciting. Uh, but what exactly is a methane seep and what sort of environment does it create? What, what will we be looking at down there, Dr. Thurber? Well, methane seeps, actually, I'm going to turn this over to Leela so she can answer. No, <laughs> okay. Um, you want to take it, actually? Sure. So uh, <laughs> methane seeps are areas where there's vast amounts of methane in the ocean, and it's buried underneath the sediment. Now, uh, where methane seeps form is where there's leaks out of these vast reservoirs. I mean, gigatons of carbon that are stored beneath it. And you can actually see in this particular image that there's bubbles coming out. Now, those bubbles are methane, and there's microbes within the sediment and within those rocks that eat that methane, turn it into energy and use that energy to essentially fix carbon or turn carbon dioxide into biomass. So that creates this huge amount of energy going into the ocean. And the more we're learning, we're learning that that energy may be a significant part of the total energy going into the deep ocean. So I also want to point out that there are many different kinds of habitats that are present within methane seeps. And so when we think about biodiversity in the deep sea, a methane seep is not one habitat. It's actually a diversity of habitats that impacts the total kinds of animals that we never really knew existed in the ocean until recently. And we're constantly discovering new ones. And it's fascinating to think that something so far below the ocean may potentially impact our global climate cycle as well, right? And we're only really beginning to understand sort of what those implications are and what that might look like for life on land. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. I always like to think about what the ocean does for us. And it's rare that we think about what a microbe does for us. But methane seeps are one of those areas where microbes actually keep the planet inhabitable by eating methane. Now, methane is a greenhouse gas. It's about 25 times as efficient as CO2 at warming our atmosphere. And so as it releases, if it got in the atmosphere, that would be really bad for us all. A society, global warming, all of these concerns, global climate change could be uh, sped up by that. But almost all that methane is actually eaten by microbes. So we like to call it an ecosystem service that these microbes are making the planet, independent of where you live, a place where humans can live. Now, methane is also going up in the atmosphere. We don't know why. We also know that as we warm our climate, we're going to be impacting some of these cycles. So the more we can learn about how these microbes are really saving us as a society now will help us be able to predict how they're going to change as we change our planet. It's amazing to be learning about this. And we do have a viewer question. Uh, one of our watchers is wondering how much of this methane makes it to the surface or are we able to measure that? So we are able to measure it. And the good answer is very little. In fact, when we look at the total global methane budget, deep sea methane seeps are not a number that we're incredibly worried about because we have two things, microbes and physics that both help us in that regard. So even if you see a bubble coming up, that methane is actually pulled out of that bubble simply due to gas physics. And then you also have more microbes in the water column that further eat that. So currently, the total amount of methane that's making it into the atmosphere is quite low. However, while we do know that some numbers in our global atmosphere are quite good, we know why we put more or how we put more CO2 in the atmosphere. 
there's a lot of ambiguity around methane seeps. And so we also want to understand how things change as you go from a shallow seep, where you're closer to the atmosphere, to a deeper seep, to make sure that our understanding, which we think is fairly rudimentary, how that actually plays out when we understand the diversity of seeps across shallow depths to deep depths, to make sure we're not making assumptions that impact our ability to understand our future Earth. Absolutely. And a lot of the scientific efforts that are focusing on deep sea methane seeps aim to better understand that role that they play in both oceanic and human ecosystems, just like you touched on. Leela, can you explain what the ocean's blue economy is and that role that methane seeps play in it? Yeah, sure. So blue economy is kind of a big topic right now. It basically encompasses the idea that we have um, a lot of resources in our oceans, which are or may be potentially um, valuable boosts to our economy, but it also kind of brings in the idea that we need to be managing those resources effectively so that we um, maintain the health of the ecosystems um, that might be impacted by use of those resources. Um, so some of those, uh, in, in terms of methane seeps, important blue economy resources uh, include, well, here you see fish. So it's essential fish habitat, um, but so a lot of fisheries depend on methane seeps um, also, there are rare earth elements there, which might be potentially useful for technological applications. Um, and in addition to that, there are gas hydrates. So potential stores of fossil fuel um, energy sources that we might be able to access in the future. Um, again, we want to make sure that we are taking advantage of those resources in a way that doesn't harm the system so that we can further benefit from the other important um, um, ecosystem services that they provide, such as being essential fish habitat. Um, so that's another thing that we're looking into on this coming cruise and really excited to, to understand better to inform future management decisions. Yeah, and looking at that imagery, I mean, it looks like something out of this world. It's wild, and yet this is happening on our planet. These are in our oceans. Um, we have a viewer question. Are, are you going to be looking for biodiversity that is specific to methane seeps? And if so, what kind of creatures are we, are we going to see here? And, and what are we looking for? So that's a great question. And actually, one of the things we're really trying to do on this cruise is not only look at the biodiversity at seeps and discover whatever might be there, but we've spent a lot of time doing that and sort of, I'd like to say, studying the oddities that have really shaped science in a different direction than we ever expected. But by focusing on that, we haven't really been able to better understand how these seeps fit into an ecosystem. So one of the things that's more unique or novel about what we're planning on this cruise is we're going to be not only focusing on the seep, but then going away from the seep and seeing how that seep impacts the entire ocean ecosystem. Now, speaking of oddities, this is like, the most amazing image of a seep. You see these tube worms. These tube worms have no mouth. They've got no anus. They work through symbiosis to be able to essentially harvest energy coming from the seep. And they create an ecosystem as an ecosystem engineer where you get all sorts of things like these anemones, which are not unique to seeps, this octopus. And then you even see those little towers, which I have to say, I was completely baffled what they were when the first time, but those are actually snail egg cases where they take advantage of the habitat created by a methane seep to be able to have successful progeny and live on. Wow, I mean, that looks like a dream that I just had, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of all of these crazy creatures, there are also among them some forms of bacteria um, or microbes that are even able to use methane seeps to make food through a process called chemosynthesis. And my understanding is that chemosynthesis is pretty similar to how plants photosynthesize on Earth, but with chemicals. Susie, do you want to explain that? <laughs> sure, yeah. Um, so the main idea with chemosynthesis, um, in terms of its parallels to photosynthesis, so what we're used to on land in terms of plant systems is that plants are getting their energy from sunlight and then using that to turn carbon dioxide into biomass, into um, sugars, into actual carbon compounds that can be used by various other creatures and organisms in um, the ecosystem. And so how that applies to methane seeps is they are also using carbon dioxide to create biomass, but the way what they use for energy is actually the methane at the seeps because they're so deep in the ocean that sunlight can't actually get down there. So the, the bacteria and archaea and other microbes that are at the seeps use the methane 
um, as well as other chemicals that are present at the seeps in order to create energy. So the methane at the seeps isn't actually very energetically favorable. Uh, they're, it, they're basically running on um, the minimal capacity needed for life, uh, but they do this th through these really cool partnerships between um, different microbes. And there's plenty of methane, and so they just use lots and lots of it in order to give energy. Very cool. And we have a viewer question that I'd love to turn to because I'm also curious, are cold seeps actually cold? <laughs> and what is that cold seep? How does that differ maybe from methane seeps or hydrothermal vents or these other features that we're looking at? So cold seeps are not cold, they're just not warm. And that's to really just contrast them with hydrothermal vents. Uh, they form through different geologic structures. Essentially, hydrothermal vents are where continental plates are pulled apart or forced together. That's not uh, what leads to methane seepage. So they're different geologically, but what it really comes down to is they're just not hot, and so we call them cold seeps. Methane seeps, cold seeps, those are the same thing. We just use slightly different terms for it, uh, depending mostly when we get tired of saying one or the other, we'll switch back and forth. <laughs> You can start throwing in like a tepid seep or a lukewarm seep. <laughs> There's been a, some of those discovered recently, but that's a different story. <laughs> <laughs> that's another live event series next time. <laughs> um, awesome. And then one of the most memorable ecosystem features that I've learned about in my time with Nautilus are microbial mats. I think that they're absolutely beautiful um, and they're almost an ecosystem unto themselves. And Carrie, we were talking a little bit about this the other day, just in terms of we kind of see them on land as well. And I'm I'm curious, you know, where have you seen these these microbial mats and, and maybe people can relate to it who have seen it themselves. And what do we know and what are we still trying to discover? So if anybody's gone to Yellowstone, that's where I've just been. and. There, it's really um, everywhere to see that here in this image, for example, the orange that you can see around the blue pool there is actually microbial mat. And beyond that is some of the carbonate that's deposited. And so really, this is chemosynthesis happening actually on land where the same, you know, where the trees in the background are, are undergoing photosynthesis. So that's some way that, that you could have seen this, but obviously in the deep sea, there's no option for photosynthesis. Um, and, and you know, as far as from our point of view as chemists, we're really interested to know um, what, what can those bacteria do? What are they busy doing? How do they communicate? Um, and what are the chemical compounds that they use to communicate in those really complex um, bacterial mats? There you can see in, in the video, um, uh, this wide pan, the orange bacterial mat. These, these mats are really, they can be very complex, even if they're dominated by one organism, um, it's a real, real ecosystem in there and, and a lot of interactions going on that we have to try and understand. Um, and how we understand that is by looking at the chemistry because you know, people use words to communicate, bacteria use chemicals to communicate for defense or to um, simply signal each other to swarm, to get together, to form a bacterial mat. So um, that's what I just found fascinating about being in Yellowstone was that um, we can see it above, you know, on land and then below at the really great ocean depths. And here you can see another photo from Yellowstone, just close up these little um, kind of towers formed. Actually, the scale is is is, is hard to um, show, but this is a real close up um, in the one of the Yellowstone pools. So all that orange in between is, is the bacterial mat and it's built up these towers of, um, mineral deposits because really these bacteria are forming rock or eating rock. It's amazing and it's also amazing that you can see these microbial mats both on nautiluslive.org and in the deep ocean and if you're visiting Yellowstone. I'm in Montana, I live here and I've been to Yellowstone a, a ton of times and absolutely find those pools amazing and we previously thought that you know bacteria was was more of a simple organism and and we're learning that they're actually quite complex um susie this is a question for you what role do microbes play in these ecosystems in these deep sea ecosystems specifically and why are they so valuable to the organisms that call these places home yeah so as i was talking about a little bit earlier um 
uh, the way that plants are kind of the base of the ecosystem on la land, or I guess in some cases there are areas like Yellowstone that are similar to um, methane seeps, but in both of, in Yellowstone and in deep methane seeps, um, microbes are the basis of the ecosystem. They're the creatures that are producing all of the food and um, the energy that is being input into the system there. And so there are um, microbes that directly eat the methane, uh, but there are also um, all sorts of other microbes in the system that eat the different chemicals that are present at methane seeps. Um, and interestingly enough, there are also animals that live with microbes inside them. And so the microbes in there are used to eat the chemicals at the seeps. And so, for example, uh, different tube worms and mussels um, have microbes within their tissues that are used to gain um, uh, the chemicals from the methane seeps so that these animals can actually live. And um, as has been shown in many of these different videos, there's all sorts of other animals like fish and um, octopuses uh, like this that go down to the seeps and consume the energy that is made there. And so the octopus is probably eating some of the clams that are there, um, just hanging out deep in the ocean. And there's all sorts of other mobile animals that, that can move around seeps and then also eat the energy that's provided there by the microbes. Yeah, Susie, I might add something to mm -hmm. that. I think one of the things that we've really been a sort of a switch in our thinking about methane seeps in the ocean has been in the last few years, we've gone from knowing of a handful off our coast to now we know of more than 2,500 off the coast of Oregon, Washington, and Northern California. And that's not unique to this area. That's just the place off my front doorstep. <laughs> so these are no longer sort of unique little pockets that may be putting out a little bit of energy, but really their swaths are just massive amounts of areas that are just shunting energy into the deep sea. And we've done some calculations. It actually looks at about 7% globally of the energy that's making into the deep sea comes from these seeps, in part just due to their completely unexpected abundance off of our coast and most people's coasts. And there, like I said, we have so much interest from our viewers about these methane seeps. We have a question from Jacob um, who wants to know, you know, obviously there's so many animals and, and deep sea organisms that benefit from methane seeps, but are there some that can maybe get hurt from them? Do we ever see deadfalls from animals who are located too close or maybe swimming too near these methane seeps? So that's a great question. And it's also a really sort of complicated question in some regards. So methane results in the formation of hydrogen sulfide as a byproduct of those microbial processes. Hydrogen sulfide is toxic. You really don't wanna have a lot of it. It's not good for our blood. And so there's this very likely chance that that sulfide could be toxic to different things. Off the coast here, we haven't seen that so much. And instead we've seen really perplexing patterns. Things like Dover sole sitting on top of hydrogen sulfide mats that should not be able to do that based on our understanding. So we think there's a lot more going on than sort of a rudimentary understanding of sulfide's toxic and bad. And yet we, we don't see massive dead critters laying on top of the seeps, although that's definitely a possibility where there could be some toxicity. We do see changes in the sediment and the animals that can live there. And a lot of that is tied to, can you live in a highly sulfitic environment? These little white patches you can see on the screen, that's highly sulfitic. Sulfitic, you don't see clams there because it's not an environment that they can live and they're adapted to seeps. But it really changes the fauna and we're better understanding the sort of limits of life of a variety of tax, including those that are not only found at methane seeps. Right, and among those are something that I'm super intrigued by are these sort of discoveries that we're making when it comes to medicinal potential in the deep ocean. So as many of you probably know, bacteria on land can be used to make antibiotics and vaccinations and pharmaceutical products that we use every single day. Um, and Carrie, you are going to be working kind of exploring the potential of deep sea bacteria that really were, again, only beginning to tap into, uh, you know, and how they might fit for medicinal purposes. Um, it's something called bioactive pharmaceutical and biotechnological compounds, which is a total mouthful. Can you kind of <laughs> explain that to me, like pretend I'm in kindergarten? <laughs> Well, you know, literally a biopharmaceutical is a pharmaceutical drug, say a medicine that you would take 
um, that comes from a biological source or it's made in a biological source like a microbe. Um, and so what we're really getting at here is that probably many of you know that bacteria on land are used to make antibiotics and perhaps you've all even used Neosporin um, antibiotic ointment, you know, the uh, gel. And that's an everyday product that actually um, was discovered and is made by a soil bacterium um, uh, or several in, in that case. So. Um, we're just beginning to see to realize actually that um, bacteria are highly creative chemists, much more so than humans. Um, really, the expert chemists um, that make chemical compounds with molecular structures um, that that humans could only imagine. Um, so, you know, many of these. Um, bioactive compounds, we also used to think, well, they come from plants or other macro organisms like um, sponges or sea squirts. And so here you can see actually a deep sea sponge um, with a fish next to it. Why would it make a cancer drug? Because in fact, they are approved cancer drugs, one called Halivan for triple negative metastatic breast cancer. Um, but so sponges would produce chemicals to protect themselves from being eaten perhaps by predators like fish or or even just to compete for space um, where they are. That's obviously maybe not such a big problem in the deep sea. Um, so, you know, we really um, realized that uh, sponges and sea squirts and microbial mats are just really full of many, many different types of bacteria. And um, what, what we want to know is, is, is what is the medical potential of, the, of those compounds? How can we use them for human health? And that doesn't only mean um, for disease, like for treating disease. What it also means is to understand more about the disease so we can use them as a chemical probe. Um, and really, we don't know what we're going to find. We, we just have the ability now to go and look and decide whether it is something useful um, or potentially useful or not. Um, because one thing that people often ask me, perhaps I can prevent a question here, is that um, why would we think that there's something down in the deep ocean where humans have never been that would help humans? And, and really the answer to that is that um, we all, all life on earth has kind of similar things in its cells like DNA and proteins and other macromolecules, lipid membranes, and the shapes of those are really con conserved to a large extent. And, and these um, small molecules that bacteria make are designed to fit into those bigger proteins or DNA. And so the 3D shape is very, very important. And here on your screen, you see a paintbrush cyanobacterium. And this is actually a filamentous photosynthetic bacterium. So we won't find it in the deep ocean, but it's certainly an example of a complex microbial consortium mix of bacteria. And it actually, this is the source of dolostatin, which has recently been um, linked to an antibody and delivered as a cancer drug. So um, this is really, you know, drug discovery in progress that the oceans are now accessible to people. We can go to the depths of the oceans, even beyond the scuba range and, and, and find something, um, you know, that could be useful to humans. Absolutely. And I love how you said that, you know, what we're seeing in the deep ocean, we're also seeing on land. And we have a viewer question who wants to know, can we expect to see methane seeps or chemosynthesis on other planets? You know, just like we find these processes here, could they be on other worlds? Absolutely. Um, and in fact, that's one of the, the sort of the enticing bits is on some of the frozen planets and the frozen moons. One of the potential sources for energy underneath those uh, ice caps, if there's liquid water, and on some planets there are, it could be methane. It could be an analogous system. Um, so yeah, it's a great question, and it really sort of makes us exciting, more excited to know what we can find on our planet, uh, so we might be able to better understand what else is out there. Yeah, and I think that um, it's super exciting to me to be able to figure out what the capabilities of life on Earth are, like what sort of weird extreme environments that we can actually find life in. And then that does give us more insight into where life could occur in other places in our universe. Yeah, methane seeps were only really first found in, in the 80s. 
Um, so we're still discovering such new things on our own planet. And of course there are, you know, given that so many different things that we don't know about other planets as well yet to be discovered. What's that saying? It's along the lines of the more I learn, the less I know. And I feel like it's so <laughs> relevant to this work, you know, the, the more that we explore. And speaking of exploring, um, when we're looking for, uh, Carrie, you said earlier, biological diversity oftentimes indicates chemical diversity. And so when we're looking at places to maybe sample um, for potential medicinal bacteria or microbes, what sort of characteristics are you looking for? So um, here you could see a very dense, um, you could see the footage of, of these mussels with um, all these organisms over them. And I guess what we kind of prioritize is if there's a very distinct boundary between say one microbial mat and then some other organisms or a different colored microbial mat that, that it is very distinct, we could imagine that there's something that's keeping them apart, that one set of animals doesn't want to overlap with another set of animals. So um, I think that the ecology is really important and being able to look at these gradients of ecosystems from further away from the methane seep going towards the middle um, is will be really, really exciting. Um, and something that's never been done is how how do those how do those organisms communicate as you get closer to the middle of the vent and how do they interact with each other because that really shows that there might be something toxic and you could say to find a new medicine you have to first look for a toxin because it's just a matter of dose so and and here you can you can just see some of the diversity um the, the change in in from one side to the other um even of of a you know rocks close by um these transitions, these interfaces between environments are really important for thinking about, is there gonna be chemical diversity? That's fascinating. And we have a great question from a viewer. What is that transition from finding something new in the ocean to then considering it as something that could cure cancer or another disease? You know, What is that thought process? That is a really, really Good question. That's fantastic because, you know, at best, we're just going to be able to detect some compounds. That probably means that we need to find, we need to perhaps rely on Andrew Thurber's lab to find the genes to make that compound. That would be one way um, to make more of the compound so that we can screen it in different types of biological activity testing. Um, another way would be that um, in my lab, we can kind of propose what the chemical looks like. What is its molecular structure? And then we have to find synthetic organic chemists who can actually build that structure. And, you know, this could take years. <laughs> and what, what are those sort of processes, uh, Andrew, that your lab looks at when you are, you know, looking at the, the DNA or the genetics of an organism or microbe? Well, I'll just say this is such an exciting time to be a scientist and the ability to analyze DNA as we have never been able to analyze it before at a scale that we've never been able to analyze it before. And so we're doing a lot of what we call genomics work and environmental genomics, which is simply sequencing all of the DNA in the sample and then trying to use really uh, exciting cutting bioinformatics, which can just be interpreted as computational algorithms to understand what genes those code for, what genes they code for that we've never seen, and then try to couple that with the amazing uh, products that Carrie's lab is able to identify to be able to see where they might actually, actually line up. So it's a lot of what we call next generation or high throughput sequencing to create environmental genomes to interrogate what's going on and what might be going on that we've never seen before, at least understood by looking at those genes directly. Yeah, and I'd also like to add um, that I've done a lot of work in this sort of omics field. Um, and it's pretty exciting to be able to look in parallel at what sort of chemicals are being produced by a community versus uh, uh, what their genomes and what sort of genetic information there. And so um, natural products chemists slash community of them that have found um, many sorts of exciting compounds in different sorts of organisms. Um, and so part of what we can do is we can compare 
our new genetic information with the information that others have found already and see if there are similarities to them, where if it could be the same compound, it could also be something that's uh, different in a meaningful way, but that's also amazing. And it's so cool to see how you all of your different roles and experience brings you together into sort of this big picture item. And I'm curious, how did you all get into these roles? Where, like, were you just interested in the deep ocean? Did you live on the coast? What in the world brought you to Nautilus and to this this field? Really, I can say perhaps that. Um, it was Andrew Thober who brought me into this. Um, <laughs> he, he was the one that that, that um, saw this opportunity, and um, so you know, I, I was just a simple organic chemist looking at bulk samples. And um, recently, though, as as Andrew said, you know, it's such an exciting time to be in science with such a reduction. Um, you know, the detection limits of, of these instruments that we can use. And here's an old photo of me scuba diving in South Africa, actually, where I had just collected this kind of fairly fist, I guess, fist sized piece of a sea squirt. And we extract that and we look for the chemicals in that. But, um, more more recently, what we're able to do is just use mass spectrometry and as Susan said, take advantage of comparing, comparing different um, mass spectrometry signatures with those that other people have found as well and using this informatics, bioinformatics or chem informatics um, technique. So we're really excited about that. And I guess that just scuba diving in the ocean um, got me interested in this in the first place. Well, I'll chime in and say that I would definitely not call Carrie um, feel a simple organic chemist. Uh, one of the reasons <laughs> why I was excited by this opportunity is that going to sea creates the opportunity for collaborative research. And through collaboration, we can advance science at a, a rate that's just not possible otherwise. And the ability to collaborate with Carrie and her lab has essentially created this opportunity to approach questions of the blue economy, which we really didn't have. Um, I have to say where I came from is uh, I was always enamored, um, I mean, the ocean calls to me, the, uh, and I, from a young age, wanted to study ocean ecosystems. Uh, this is me fishing with my grandfather um, many, many years ago, as you can tell, <laughs> uh, and learning about what the ocean does and how the ocean fits into society. And, and since then, I like to kind of consider myself an academic hobbit, where when I leave my front door, I don't know where I'm going to end up. I never... <laughs> I never expected to study the deep sea or to have these opportunities, but the excitement and the possibilities to uncover unknowns about the world that can help inform us and our future actions and inform management is just an exciting thing and a, and a great path to take. Awesome, and we, we have a viewer question as well. What does it take to get on EV Nautilus? And Leela, I'd love to hear a little bit about your experience and what you brought, what brought you aboard the ship. Yeah, sure. Um, so I guess where I'm coming from, I first became interested in marine science as an undergraduate uh, at Eckerd College, where I studied marine science and got my bachelor's. Um, and But it was really after Eckerd that I first became super interested in, in deep sea habitats. And so um, I went out on the EV Nautilus first as an intern, um, as a science and engineering intern uh, through that program uh, through OET. So I went out to the Papahanaumoku Kea Marine National Monument. Um, that's me in the center there in front of our ROV Hercules. Um, and we had just collected some samples. And so that's where I became really interested in deep sea research and um, being that that was a Marine National Monument also in how we manage uh, those ecosystems and um, how we might better conserve them in the future. Um, and also there's just so much that we don't know about uh, waters under US jurisdiction like Papahanaumoku Akea. That was the first time that anyone had dove in that area. So there's just really so much to be discovered and it's really exciting. You can always tell who's been on a cruise in that part of the world because they can pronounce it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we did get trained on that ahead of time. <laughs> And Susie, you shared with us a really amazing photo of you getting into science at an early age. What brought you aboard EV Nautilus? Yeah, um, so it's it's been kind of a long journey for me. Um, I have been interested in science from a pretty young age. Um, if this picture ever shows up, then I will be able to 
show you. So here is a picture of young me at some aquarium touch tank. And I, um, so I have this photo and then I also turned it into kind of a scrapbook sort of thing where I wrote on the side, a leopard shark, cool. So that's been pretty much my uh, approach to things ever since. Whenever I see something like a new organism or an animal or something, I'm just really excited being able to see that. And so that's what's so cool about um, the, the Nautilus is that you get to watch this footage in real time and then people can say, oh, hey, there's an octopus and it's there. Um, but basically in terms of my kind of academic background. Oh, look, an octopus, cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but in terms of my academic background, I knew I was interested in biology um, in high school and before that, but um, I didn't really know that I was interested in microbiology until I got to college. And another thing that I kind of discovered in college was I was at UC San Diego at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And so what was really cool to me was how integrative that um, oceanography was as a field. It's not only just focusing on the biology or the animals or the microbes, but it's also focusing all, on all the different physical aspects of the ocean, um, on the chemistry of things, on the way that of the water and the air moves and how all of these systems kind of integrate into the entirety of life on earth and earth systems. And so that's what's super exciting to me about doing ocean research. I might just uh, jump in that one of the things I like about the photo of Susie at a young age was that she's in a science learning center or a touch tank to essentially get excited about the ecosystem. And one of the things that I love about the Nautilus, and I really am excited for all the people that are listening in, and I hope you'll join us at sea, is that our greatest barrier to people understanding that deep ocean is just that they don't know what's there. So tune in and see what's there, because having people see what's in the ocean and learn what's there is really the first step to understanding and caring about an ecosystem, and it'll help inform future decisions. Absolutely. And we say this all the time, you know, to get started in science and to get started in deep sea exploration, it starts with a keen sense of interest. And so really, you know, having that excitement and that motivation, I think, is great advice to getting anyone excited and into the field and, and at least starting that way. And, you know, just as we're looking towards in this next, our last couple of minutes here, I just want to ask you all, what are you most looking forward to during this cruise? And what do you most want to see? A, a viewer actually asked that question, so I can't take credit for it. <laughs> Carrie, how about you? Um, you know, I guess that I've never really seen the methane seeps live as they are discovered, as, as an animal walks across the screen. Um, and so to actually see them and be able to make a decision right in the moment of, oh, let's go and have a look at it. And so, you know, that for me is, is, is what I'm most looking forward to. And just the interaction and being able to learn from the scientists and other people who are right there on the ship um, is a great opportunity. Awesome. Andrew, what are you looking forward to? If I've learned anything from going to sea, it's that I never know what I'm going to find and I never find what I'm expecting to find. So I'm looking forward to being proven wrong or right, depending on how you interpret that. Uh, I'm looking forward to finding something I've never seen before or we don't expect to find on this side of the coast. I'm looking forward to the unknown. Yeah, um, I guess I'm just really looking forward to being out here as a graduate student. Um, I've been out on Nautilus twice before. Uh, as a member of the science management team. And so now I'm really looking forward to doing both that again, but also um, being out as a graduate student and having the research that we're doing pertain to my own research that I'll be getting to conduct. So I'm um, just really excited for that new experience. Yeah, and I would say that what I'm most excited about is actually the collaborations between all the different cool scientists that are working on this. And so, um, We've got our science team on board, but then we're also going to have a lot of different collaborators that are coming in through um, remote scientists at shore program. And so that includes Carrie, but it includes also the folks that we're working with at the, um, the Olympic National Marine Monument. 
sanctuary. Sanctuary. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but, but basically, the, the idea is that like all of these folks have their different perspectives and different areas of focus. And so it's really cool to hear things from perspectives that I didn't expect and that um, it's really interesting to see how all of these different puzzle pieces fit together. Awesome. And I am most excited to be tuning in live at nautiluslive.org, listening to your voices and just being a part of the expedition with you all, even though I'm not even on the coast. I, I can hardly wait. Um, for those of you watching at home, just like me, the next cruise with uh, with Dr. Thurber Lab and then the Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary starts September 20th, um, Sunday, that's this Sunday, at midnight Pacific time. So be sure to tune in. It's a late night, but it's totally worth it. Um, and actually what just started while we were on this call is the last cruise of the uh, Ocean Networks Canada dive. So I or the last dive of the cruise, I should say. <laughs> and so I encourage you again, tune in. It's going to be a great one. We're really, really excited. And just as, as a reminder, if you like today's event, tell your friends and colleagues and check out upcoming events on the education page on nautiluslive.org. Our next event will be the second part of the expedition overview, so similar to what we did today, um, next on Nautilus, diving in the Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary. <laughs> so be sure to check that out. Um, and again, we will see all of you at nautiluslive.org. Thank you so much for joining us. And thanks, thanks all for coming. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> see you next time.